<laughs> okay, good morning. My name is Dave Parker, and I'm here to talk about snakes in hill country. And my talk is, you could sort of describe it as common sense about snakes. Um, it's a generally informative talk about snakes. And to, to, to begin at the beginning, people have always asked me, why do you like snakes? And I, I wish I had a dollar for every time that I've been asked that. And I've liked snakes since I was three years old. My first memories of a snake. The first book I ever owned was about a snake. Uh, the, I begged my, my parents moved all around the country and they took me to zoos and museums, but they didn't like snakes. They encouraged me to read about them. They took me to libraries, and, but I was not allowed to have snakes until I was my mother for my 17th birthday as my, her gift to me gave me permission to keep snakes in my bedroom. I went out, I bought a snake, and four months later I had 60 snakes in my bedroom. She wow. knew what would happen. <laughs> but but uh, I, I went on to work in zoos, I worked in museums, uh, I've worked as a field collector for universities. Um, I've, I, uh, I am a herpetologist. I'm a graduate herpetologist. I went to graduate school and studied uh, um, systematics and evolution and with rattlesnakes as my study group and uh, as my study object. And, uh, uh, and it, but I've been a herpeticulturalist all my life. And herpeticulturalists are people that keep reptiles or amphibians in captivity live, work with live animals. And that's what you would call a zookeeper. Was a, they're, technically they're a herpetoculturalist if they work in the reptile the, uh, And so I, my interest is in uh, yeah, just all aspects of snakes. But I, I mean, I have a particular fascination. Um, for the last 30 years, I've worked on pythons and my wife and I together. I married a herpetologist and a herpetoculturalist. So, Good thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really it's amazing. <laughs> you're, you're laying in bed late at night and you're talking about all pythons. It's heaven. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so, so I have some live snakes here, but I don't have anything that's going to escape. I don't have anything that's venomous. I have all snakes that are. Uh, I try to always bring a couple of wild snakes to one of these shows. Things that were just caught in the last day or two to show. You know, if you hand snakes are handled nicely, they behave nicely. They behave in in kind and. Uh, but I, these are all hardened veterans of talks like this, and uh, they'll, they'll do just fine. I have snakes, when we're done, I have snakes that you can hold, or just touch, or just get close to, or take its picture, whatever suits you, nobody has to do anything. I, I was the curator of education at the Gladys Porter Zoo for a few years, and, and they asked me one time to do a talk for the Rotary Club, and this is all men in Brazil. And, um, I was standing in a restaurant and I got up to do my talk and I was kind of, you know, they said you only have 15 minutes and I was like, how can you talk about snakes in 15 minutes? But they, and I got up and I said, all right, now, first I want to say I brought a snake here to show you guys and I, <laughs> <laughs> and <it was> panic. <laughs> it was great. All the chairs suddenly stood back, everyone was looking at their feet and it was, uh, the, uh, and I, I did it to illustrate that, you know, to convince myself that everybody doesn't love snakes. I, I, I'm always shocked when I find that out, but it's true. I've, I've grown to accept it. The, uh, um, but I, I think most of the animosity that's, and fear that's directed towards snakes is for a few simple reasons that I want to discuss here today. And I think. What I'm trying to do is give you answers to questions that as naturalists, you're going to be asked. Um, there are some general things that people don't understand about snakes. And I brought my, this is, this is my largest snake. <laughs> yeah, this is a six, six foot python. <laughs> no, this is a um, it's an anatomically pretty correct stuffed snake, and the uh, but I brought I brought it to to to, to 
demonstrate several things. And the first thing, though, is that snakes are animals. That seems to be the greatest misconception that people have about snakes. It's like God made all the animals and the devil made snakes. The, the snakes are animals, and a snake has red blood, um, it drinks water, it eats food, it breathes air, it metabolizes and it respires, um, it feels pain, it feels curiosity, it's capable of learning a lot of, I mean, they, they, they're smart. They're about, in my opinion, as smart as dogs, although a lot of what snakes do is more controlled by instinct than the behavior of dogs. Snakes have instinctive behaviors that when they enter into that behavior, that instinct, it has to play out to the end. It doesn't, um, they can't stop it. And, and so, but then when they come to the end of the instinct, an instinct, instinctual, uh, the suite of actions that the instinct has uh, caused the snake to, to, to do, then you've got your old buddy back. I mean, it's, you know, they're, they just go back to a conscious mode where they're thinking about things. Snakes have an incredible ability to memorize maps, which for an animal that lives in burrows is really important. So they, 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 uh, there are no studies published on running snakes through mazes because snakes make mice look like idiots. And, and the journals, the behavior journals, just won't accept those papers. I know several, I've submitted one, was 40 years ago, but, but they just, you just get it back. It's got red marks all over and it's like, this is impossible. And how, you know, if a snake is 76% correct, how can a snake be 95? It, obviously following their own trail, or obviously following the trail of mice, or obviously, no, they're just smart. They're good at that. They live in burrows and they, that's an important thing. When you encounter a snake in the wild, the average snake in hill country has a lifespan of, um, they need, you know, in order for the species to exist in hill country, they have to live long enough to reproduce. And most of the snakes here reproduce at two to five years of age for the first time. But they have a maximum lifespan of 25 or 30 years. And so they're not like butterflies. It's not like every, you know, you kill one, but in the next year a thousand more come out or whatever. When a snake, and when you find a snake, snakes are territorial animals. A snake usually lives within a few acres of where he hatched out of an egg with all of his siblings. They've all been picked off over the years. They've been eaten by a number of things or killed by people. And they, the snake that's left that's a big snake, he knows where every hole in the ground is for hundreds of yards in any direction where you find him. He knows where every bit of security is. He knows how to get out of trouble, where to go. He's got basking spots where hawks can't get him. He's got feeding spots where there's rodent activity or bird activity or whatever it is that he eats. And what snakes eat are other animals. All snakes are predators. All snakes are carnivores. There are no snakes that eat fruit or vegetables of any sort. They, uh, they, they, um, but, and some snakes are generalists. They eat almost anything littler than they are. And, but most snakes are specialists. Most snakes eat only rodents, or if it's a big snake, or they may eat rabbits. If it's a really big snake, a snake this size could eat a rabbit. Um, and they, you know, they're a major control of jackrabbits and cottontails out west in ranching country where they're, you know, they said, the state of Texas did a study that was published about 20 years ago and their, their conclusions were that five diamondback rattlesnakes can save the average rancher $10,000 a year in reducing the number of rabbits and rodents that are competing with cattle for edible grasses. And that there's actually an economic incentive to leave the snakes alone. And of course people go, well, you know, one of the problems with snakes is they bite people and they bite livestock. And, and, uh, and they, you know, they kill cattle and they kill whatever. But if you look at the insurance companies cover livestock loss due to rattlesnake bite. And there are no published losses of, 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 uh, of livestock from, uh, people don't claim livestock losses due to rattlesnake bite and, and any kind of significant thing that would indicate that out there in West Texas, the cattle are being slaughtered by the rampaging rattlesnakes. Um, they, uh, um, 
they just they don't you know because I'll say this several times during the talk but snakes never bite people when they never bite cattle snakes never bite anything in an offense unless they think they're being attacked they only bite defensively it big big things dangerous things if they think they're being attacked. Now, if you're walking in tall grass and you step on a snake, he'll bite you and you didn't see him, but he didn't see you. As far as he's concerned, from his point of view, he just got attacked. But there are no snakes that, in the United States that chase people, bite people, you know, that feel like it's their part in nature to terrorize people. It just wouldn't pay off. And uh, so snakes want to avoid trouble. and. That's part of being an animal. Snakes are animals. Now, the kind of animals they are is something that people don't understand. One of the things about snakes that people don't understand is that snakes are really short animals. This snake is six feet long, but he's only two inches tall. <laughs> and when you're only two inches tall, everything in the world looks really big. <laughs> You know, I mean, they're, 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 you know, they're, and you're walk, you walk along and you go, oh my gosh, look at that snake, it must be six feet long. Well, he's looking at you and going, look at that thing, it must be 35 times taller than me. And they're, they're, uh, they're you know, snakes are really short animals and that has a lot to do with how they react in the world. Snakes divide the world of animals around them into two kinds of, basically, two kinds of animals. Animals that are littler than they are and animals that are bigger than they are. Okay, of the type, the animals that are littler than they are, they subdivide that into two types. There's animals that are good to eat and there's animals that are not good to eat. Um, so if a snake encounters a little animal that's good to eat, he tries to capture it, kill it, and then swallow it. If he encounters an animal that's not good to eat, if this snake encounters a tarantula or a box turtle or uh, something he doesn't want to eat, he just leaves it alone. He just, he just completely ignores it. He's like, there's movement, there's an animal. Oh, it's a box turtle, I don't eat box turtles. And they just go on as they don't hurt anything that they don't want to eat. This snake wouldn't eat bullfrogs. But this snake, if this were a real snake, would eat something like larger, like pigeons or doves or rabbits or rats. Um, and if he encounters those, he's designed to catch, kill, and eat that animal. Now, there's little animals and there's big animals. When a snake encounters a big animal, they subdivide that into two kinds of animals. There's animals that actively hunt, catch, kill, and eat snakes. And in this area here, they've got ringtails, raccoons, possums, bobcats, coyotes, gray fox, house cats, especially dogs, um, bass, hawks, red-tailed hawks, especially, um, golden eagles eat them, um, roadrunners eat them, um, basically everything that eats other animals eats snakes. They love snakes, they're easy to swallow. And so, that, so, so, okay, so there's two kinds of big snakes as far as snakes are concerned. There's snakes that actively hunt, catch, kill, eat snakes. And then there's animals that just accidentally kill snakes. Like, like cows. Cows have no truck with snakes, but if a cow's walking along, not paying any attention, and <clears throat> that, he's broken that snake's back and the snake's dead. So as far as snakes are concerned, there are no good big animals. All big animals, and they're short. All big animals pose a risk to them. You know, and they, they don't like big animals. They're terrified of big animals. And whenever snakes encounter a big animal, they do, um, they do a variety of behaviors in a sequence. The first thing they try to do, they usually do, is they don't move. And almost always snakes are really camouflaged and blend in, even as bright as they might be if I put a snake hair on, on the table and, and you go, oh my god, how could you not see that? But if they're coiled up in dead leaves or they're uh, on the water's edge or they're some, you just walk right by them. And everybody here who's walked, picnicked, camped, hiked, trail bike, 
you've been within inches of rattlesnakes and you never knew they were there. They, never, they just never, they just didn't move. They, because snakes watch your face and they, they go, it doesn't see me, it doesn't see me. This snake, snakes have good, snakes can hear. They, can, they can't hear as well as people do, but they can hear human voice and they hear certainly branches crackle and things, you know, make noise. They hear noises. And snakes don't have any outer ears though. Snakes don't have any outer ears because if they had outer ears with their chin on the ground, they get dirt in their ears and they don't have any fingers to get the dirt out. So they <laughs> snakes don't have any outer ears, but snakes have a well-designed inner ear that this, this is the skull of the snake. There's a, a ear bone that comes out here and, it, and comes under the underside of a big flat bone that goes just under the skin right there. And that acts as an ear. And right here, right where the ears would be, acts as an eardrum on a snake. Um, <clears throat> they also, because of, they have their chin on the ground, they also do hear vibrations or feel vibrations in the ground that we're not aware of at all. But a lot of times, if they, even if they don't hear you, they may sense you're there, or a cow's there, or something's heavy there. They may, they may know that. Snakes have, most snakes have pretty good vision, but it kind of depends on the lifestyle of the snake. Little burrowing snakes tend to have very short-sighted vision. But big active snakes can see, they can tell one person from another person at least 50 or 100 feet away. If they, if they know their keeper, for example, people go, well, I think my snake likes me. Yeah, he likes you. If you feed him and you've raised him his whole life, he can tell you when you walk in the door, he knows who you are. And uh, by looking at you, <coughs> excuse me, this, this uh, rainy weather we're having today is a... If the snake doesn't know you, um, can they still distinguish that there's two people and... Oh yeah, they're still there. Awesome. Oh yeah, they, they may just be more on their on their. You know, we had a an African rock python we raised one time. And it was 14 feet long. This big old snake, very suspicious snake. Lo loved us, me, my wife, and a guy that worked for us. She could do anything with her. But we did experiments with her where we had a, we have a room that's 40 feet long, and it's just like we we encourage her to come out of her cage and she'd stick her head out. So they have an eye on either side. So one eye is looking up the 40 feet to the door and I'd have somebody she knew step in front of the door. She had no reaction whatsoever. Then I had somebody who she didn't know step out of the door and she just immediately would turn and hiss and back into the, you know, get defensive and back into the cage. It was not a nice snake if you didn't know her. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, but she was a smart snake, and it just was the example. I convinced a lot of herpetologists, of like, oh, you're so full of crap. Snakes can't have one person from another. And we'd go down there, and I'd show them. And she definitely knew one person from another person. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so the first thing when a snake realizes that a big animal's in the area, the first thing a snake does is don't move. You know, make your, don't make, you know, the first decision is you're probably okay. And if it's a person or a poor coyote or whatever, they're, they're watching the face of that animal. But if that animal looks at them, then they do their second thing, which is run for cover. Flee. Get under a big bush, get down a hole, get in a hollow tree, just get somewhere where that thing can't get you. But they know where everything is. And they, a lot of times they think, well, I can't possibly, I can't get to a safe place. And so um, they do the third thing that they do, which is act really incredibly mean, confident, and deadly. Mm -hmm. And they, they coil up and they start striking, you know, and they go, ha, 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 in the air. You're standing here and there's a 10 inch garter snake right there. And he's facing you and he's going, ha, ha biting at the air and he's and you're, you're probably not close enough to realize they've released really odiferous musk from their from their anus and they're rubbing it all over themselves because they think you might want to eat them so they're so they're making themselves stinky and where they're not as good to eat and they're acting as mean as they can possibly mean and the whole time they're doing that they're backing away and it 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 works it works like this if you have a snake that's laying across the trail and a cow's walking along. A cow. 
and the snake becomes aware of the cow, the snake does this, you know, he's like, I'm out in the open, I'm not hidden, there's no place nearby to go, this, you know, is a monstrous animal right here, and he's, you know, and so the snake does everything he can, then he doesn't want to be stepped on, so he's make noise, he makes motion, he, he musks on himself, he's biting at the air, and he's doing all this, and the cow causes the cow to look down and go, oh, wow, there's a little snake here. And he's lost his mind. <laughs> and the cow walks around the snake, goes to the barn. The snake doesn't get hurt. The cow doesn't get hurt. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how it's worked for 140 million years that snakes have been on the planet, which is way longer than we've been on the planet. And unfortunately, we're not as smart as cows. <laughs> because when the snake does what's worked for 140 million years with so many kinds of animals, it doesn't work with people. They're like, he wasn't afraid of me. He's got to be poisonous. I know he looks like a garter snake, but he's not. Look at him. He's not standing down. He's not whatever. And that brings up the second thing that people don't understand about snakes. Snakes are really short. Snakes are really slow. They ain't got no legs to run on. Right? The fastest snake ever measured. My, day, my information may be dated, but the fastest snake that I can find a record of that's, that's ever been measured going along was a was a coach whip, which is a fairly common snake in hill country. And it was zooming along, burning up the ground, going about seven miles an hour. Now, the fastest a rattlesnake's ever been measured going is two and a half miles an hour. And a rattlesnake moving at its own speed, exploring or just moving from one area to another, moves at about a tenth of a mile an hour. Now, people walk two to four miles an hour. They jog four to seven miles an hour. They can run from you know seven or eight miles an hour up to 25 miles an hour if they're an Olympic you know, sprinter. People only run 50 miles an hour if a snake is chasing <laughs> right? And, and I've seen it. People come dashing in, you know, jump in their car and drive off and they're like, and the snake was biting the tires as they drove off. And it's just, that's what the story turns into. But it just, it's a, uh, it, snakes are, are really slow, and the average snake that you're going to encounter, and they seem like they're faster than they are. And snakes are capable of quick motions. They can thrash, they can strike, they can do whatever, but in terms of going from here to the end of that room, no, no. It would take a snake five minutes to get down there, and it's just they're not fast creatures. And so they don't chase people, they don't chase their prey. They just, they just not how they're built to, 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 to work in nature. They, uh, so snakes are really, um, they're short and they're slow. And the third thing is that people don't understand about snakes is that they're silent. And that's a terrible problem. Snakes can't scream. Right? You take a shovel and hit a chipmunk. I'm told the chipmunk squeaks in its little pitfall and then you feel sorry for it. I'm not saying I've ever hit a chipmunk with a shovel, but the, if you hit a snake with a shovel, it just lays there. They're like, well, he didn't even feel that. And it's like they, they whap, 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 or cut him in half, set him on fire, boil him up with dynamite, roll, run the car back and forth over him. If snakes could scream, people wouldn't do that to them. Right? They, but snakes can't scream. They can't go. That really hurts. But does it really hurt? Yes, because this snake and every snake has more nerve endings in every inch of their skin than you have in your fingertips. And they feel pain exquisitely. They, they're, they're, and they feel temperature differences, too. That's the main reason for all those nerves in the skin and also picking up vibrations. When, at the Dallas Zoo, we used to have a... Uh, I worked at the Dow Zoo for 10 years, and at the Dow Zoo, we used to have a huge reticulated python. She had a head about this big, and she would coil up with her head against the glass. It was perfect because the public could see the side of her head, and, and, and she could see, though, during the day when people were there, she was asleep. And you could tell she was asleep because when snakes go to sleep, their pupils sag down. They don't have any eyelids. Um, their eyes are covered by the skin that covers the whole snake. but their pupils would sag down, and so I said, no, okay, now watch this, and I would open up the door really carefully. This people were talking, you know, and I was trying to impress people about how delicate they were, and I would sneak in, the, the, there were some, she was on gravel, but there were some concrete places where you could step, 
and not make any vibrations. And so I would, and they would, you know, they would give me, somebody who knew what I was doing, give me a thumbs up. I had accidentally waked her up because she didn't like people. You didn't want to be in there if she woke up. And then I would very theatrically pull out one hair and I would just take the hair and touch her somewhere on the neck and instantly her eyes were, she woke up. <laughs> this is a 200 pound snake. And that, I mean, she could feel that hair touch her. And, uh, and, and um, they're really delicate creatures. Now, one of the problems snakes have without having legs is that they have the highest percentage of body in contact with the earth at all times, and that's abrasive. Snakes have come up with a wonderful way to deal with it, and it's not, you know, it's not magic. It's snakes grow a, a layer of keratin over their entire body, including over their eye. That's like a contact lens over their eye. Now, keratin is what our fingernails are made out of and all our hair is made out of and, and uh, toenails and, all, you know, whatever. That's keratin. It's a very tough uh, uh, protein. And it, um, but the snake, you know, it's, it goes around their lips, even slightly on the inside of their mouth. The whole snake is covered in, in keratin. And um, snakes, in order to do this, Snakes have had to modify their the, the behavior, the uh, the physiology of their epidermis. Humans shed their skin. People, oh, you know, snakes really weird. Snakes shed their skin. Well, humans shed their skin too. The most common component of household dust is human cell fragments, and they we shed an estimated half a billion cells or cell fragments a day. Every human in the, on Earth does that. Snakes don't do that. Instead, snakes shed in response to a hormonal command, and they sh they they shed every cell on their every skin cell on their body grows a new layer of keratin, and then under the old layer of keratin, and then the new layer of keratin secretes a fluid, an oily fluid. That's what they're technically called. You don't even not even where it's there. And then they break the skin loose off their lips by rubbing their face against something, and then the whole skin comes off of them, just like taking, you know, hose off by getting it at the top and then pulling it off so it's inside out after it comes off your foot. That's what it comes off. You know, eventually they work the whole thing. When you watch them do it, it's really cool because they start off and they go to something rough and they break it loose from their face and they break it loose from their face and then they rub it back on their head to here and they rub it off their chin to here. And now they've got to roll around here. So they just go all around tree trunks, rocks, anything and try to catch that roll and push it down and catch it. And then they, and they just eventually get it all pushed down. Um, the, um, Yeah, I'll use a real snake here. The uh, so 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 snakes shed, uh, and they do it because they want to have this layer of keratin that covers their entire body, and it makes them friction almost friction free. And that's why snakes are shiny, but they're not wet. They're not, absolutely not wet, not slimy, not whatever. Snakes were slimy, they'd look like little dirt balls with eyeballs in five minutes crawling around on the ground. They're, you never see a dirty snake because nothing sticks to the keratin. And it allows them to go over, you know, basically what skin, snakes do is swim on dry land. And it, it's really hard to do that. If it was if it was easy to do that, then all the little fish in Cibolo Creek would be out, you know, on Main Street begging for food. They they swimming on dry land is tough, and uh, they and the problem is friction. And they that's how they've uh, uh, got, gotten over that problem. This is a hill country snake. This is an. Uh, it's, kind of, it's called a Great Plains rat snake or an Emery's rat snake. And this is a snake that my wife and I live five miles west of town, and we found a male and a female of these over a period of a year, maybe two years. And we kept them, we kept them and brought them inside, and we breed them, and every year we hatch out about eight to ten babies, and we let them go. 
So we're just to try and, you know, we just wanted to protect the two of them. And they're, you can see they're not, she's not exactly alarmed by being in, around people or in captivity. And uh, they're, 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 it's a, just a wonderful, sweet, you know, and that's, you know, you can, they're just clean. <laughs> they're amazing things. So, so, I just, do you have any idea how old the two were when, um, you when took we them got in? them? They were probably eighteen months. Okay. They were young adults, okay. and in captivity, she she should live twenty to thirty years. Um, in the wild, just they live, you know, percentage only a percentage of the ones that hatch out. Only about they believe about ten what ten percent of the babies that hatch out live to reproduce. And and that's because that takes in this snake probably three years old, two yeah. and a half to three years old. Is she going to grow any bigger? Um, the snakes grow to adult size, and then they grow the rest of their life. They grow to their adult size in two to three years, and then they grow the rest of their life. But she might grow a quarter of an inch. I mean, not not really appreciably. I didn't. I, I mentioned the snakes. Um, well, I can show an online snake here. Snakes. Snakes have the skeleton of a snake is that they have a skull and a backbone that goes all the way down to the tip of the tail, and they've got and her anus in a snake's called a cloaca because it's a single body opening for reproductive and excretory purposes. Um, they they uh, there's no ribs in the tail, but there's ribs that start right behind the head and every vertebra, and she has about. Oh, 300 vertebra. Um, every vertebra has a pair of ribs that go go down the sides of it. So these are all ribs in here. The ribs don't connect on any snake in the in the midline though. There's no bones on the stomach of a snake, and those are the only bones in a snake. That's they have a skull, a backbone, and ribs, and uh, and the backbone goes all the way down here. The backbone's constructed sort of like our backbone. If you break it, the snake's dead. It doesn't heal. What did you say the name of that snake? This is an Emory rat snake or Great Plains rat snake. Um, so they, they um, so, and so this snake has a heart. It's right about here. It's neck from the head down to here, just like it's pretty much neck from here to my heart on me. Um, at, starting at the heart, she has one lung that goes all the way down to a probably here but the back two-thirds of the lung are like the rubber bulb on an eyedropper they 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 by contracting and expanding in this back two-thirds it brings fresh air into the front third so the front third is where all the blood vessels are and oxygen exchanged she has a stomach that stomach which is about from here to here and the uh, and the stomach turns in, goes through a duodenum, goes into a small intestine, and the small intestine goes into a large intestine, and the large intestine comes out here. The, uh, the tail on the snake is like the tail on a dog. You know, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's after the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Everything after that is tail. The, uh, Would she ever bite? Uh, you know, I, I, if, if you just did something horrible to her, she's never been to you. She, I, I've never had a snake bite any. You know, in, in a, a group like this, I've never had a snake bite anybody. But I didn't ever have. Any, you know, if I bit her real hard, she might turn around and bite me on the end of my nose, and she might not. She might let me kill her without ever biting. Um, they're just they get they get so tame sometimes when they that they it's just not. You know, it's it's not second nature to them. Does she have a name? She does not have a name. She should have a name. She does not have a name, and that's unfortunate. Does the keratin ever crack, or is there ever any damage that happens to that? If you take shoe? if you take sandpaper and, and sand the spot, you know, whenever her shoes in the wild, and she, you know, abraded an area of the body and the rock, or uh -huh. a pinch spot, or an animal breath, or pierced her skin they'll go right into a shed. They create a new skin underneath the old skin and shed off the old damaged skin and they just repair it right away. Uh, so, are they ever snake by pools of diesel uh, in junkyards and just didn't go, you know, didn't go in there through the skin, it didn't hurt them or whatever, they were just a 
they didn't like the smell, but they weren't paying any attention. It was like, oh, I got, I'm in diesel. It just didn't hurt them. And uh, they're, they're, it, they're tough. They're tough. There's, it's kind of funny. They, you know, in the United States, people keep snakes. It's a, and it's a growing hobby. It's an interesting business. And, and because of, there are more and more people who like snakes and they become, you know, when I was young, People kept snakes. People have kept snakes in the United States since the country was founded. Um, but until about the 1990s, if you had a collection of snakes at your house, you didn't let your neighbors know. <laughs> because, not because it was illegal, but because they would, people would think you were weird, you know? And they were, in the 1970s, when I uh, really started speaking professionally, um, being chased by snakes was the number one dream image of nightmares wow. in the United States. And stophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes, was, a, was always number one or two in the, in the list of the top ten phobias in the United States. Public speaking has almost always been number one. The, uh, um, I obviously don't suffer from that. The, uh, um, Today, I got on the computer and looked around and I may have not found it, but I can't find a phidiophobia or dream nightmare, nightmare images. Snakes aren't even on the list anymore. I mean, they, they become so commonplace. I mean, I'm, do any of you keep snakes? Do any of you know somebody who has a snake? You do, you do, you don't, you did, did you, know, you don't know anybody that has a pet snake? The, 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 the statistics on the, the numbers on who has snakes in the United States depend on whether you're talking, depend on where you get the statistics or the numbers from. But there's somewhere between 2 million and 10 million American homes have snakes in them as pets. And the average person doesn't have one snake. <laughs> so they may have not had 60 like I did, but they, they, um, I, I was going to say, snakes are such a deal. There's entire businesses that all they do is sell snake bags. <laughs> like it's a modified pillowcase, but it's, <laughs> but there's people that they sell snake bags. You know, there's people that, and it's not just snakes. There's, you know, um, uh, there's a gecko. I mean, gecko lizards are really popular, and there's a number of just really interesting lizards that have, that have, uh, come into the, the uh, pet market and uh, um, that uh, and that's caused a mark there's a uh, uh, there's a there's a market for raising uh, crickets neoworms um, isn't that a pretty snake yes. this is a hill country snake they're, they're found mostly in southern hill country. They're, they, they, I've never seen one in Bernie, but they've been found in Pike Creek and Bandera. And they're, it's a Chihuahuan desert snake. It's, it's actually a Chihuahuan desert species that has sort of wandered up into hill country, a southern hill country. But, but they're found. It's a Baird's rat snake. What's it called? Baird. At many named, after, named after Spencer Baird, the great Smithsonian scientist from so the, the same family as the it's the same snake family as this like, Emery's rat snake okay. and and uh, they that far as I know they don't interbreed in the wild they overlap where they're found but I've never no one's ever found a hybrid that I'm aware of and this is pretty much the same deal we we own some property out in Valverde County where this snake came from. We, we took home one male, one female, we breed them every year, hatch about 10 babies out, take them back out and let them go. And um, it just, it's just, I, they're just lovely. And they're good for this because this snake, this is, this, is, this is a true story. I built a house out there with another guy. Uh, we started about six years ago. And he, <laughs> he, uh, he, he's a snake phobic. And, and one, one day I showed up and I caught a baby bull snake on the way in. And I had a bull snake in a snake bag. And I have that bull snake with me. Actually. Is it trying the, to get warm? Huh? Is that snake trying to get warm? It, oh, no. She's just trying to, you know, just trying to get you. out of the limelight. Yeah. But the, the, this snake almost, even, well, um, this is the story. 
so we were painting a door and I was painting the door jam and he was painting the door and we were both on our hands and knees and the door to the, the back door was open and he all of a sudden he goes, Dave, there's a snake, there's a snake. And I was like, it's the, it, I thought he just saw the bull snake bag moving. And I said, that's in the bag. It's not going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. He goes, no, 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 it's a snake. And I looked over at him and between us was this snake. And she crawled in the back door. She had her head up and she was looking at me and then she looked at him and then she looked at me and then she looked at him. And I was like, I just put my hand out and picked her up and she was like an instant pet. Oh, wow. She just, she was like, you know, it's kind of rough out here in the desert. Maybe I heard you got, <laughs> I heard you have access to mice. And so maybe I thought, you know. What is her diet? Uh, they, it's believed that they're found, that a significant part of their diet is bats. They're often found up near in Caton and around the begin openings of caves out in West Texas. Uh, in, in captivity, they eat mice. And and the thing is, and to to, to clarify something, um, we buy mice and rats that are pre-killed and frozen. It's like TV dinners for snakes. <laughs> this snake, and, and at least since she's been in captivity, she's never seen a live mouse. Um, she, uh, she, you know, she'd know what to do because she was a big snake when I when I caught her. But, um, but, but she was just it's a and the reason why is in captivity. Sometimes snakes aren't hungry, and if you put a live mouse in with a snake, well, in two hours the mouse is hungry, and there's only one edible thing in the snake cage usually, and that's the snake. And so after four or five or six or eight hours, the mouse is starving now. And so it goes over and takes a bite out of the snake. Well, the snake, they don't have any instincts to defend themselves from that sort of a thing. So the snake will coil up with its head in the middle of its coil to protect it. And the mouse will eat a hole right through the snake. Wow. And they're, they're probably one of the number one things that kill pet snakes is live mice. So it's just like, you know, we, we never feed live anything to anything um how frequently this snake would eat uh, maybe four mice a month and maybe two mice in you know in a meal but two weeks apart and, and she'll eat she doesn't eat year round she'll eat maybe um 30 meals maybe maybe in her case 40 meals in a year but um cheap to feed yeah, oh yeah, they're way cheaper than dogs or cats, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Although mice aren't cheap. And if you want, you know, it's a huge business raising mice and rats. It's a huge business. And, uh, you know, there's a business, Harlan Spray Dolly in Madison, Wisconsin, raises tens of thousands of rats for medical research. And so they have lineages of rats that have breast cancer, or they have skin diseases, or they have... Uh, I don't think whatever, but if you want to buy a, 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 a two-year-old female rat with breast cancer, um, the, the uh, that that rat costs probably a thousand dollars for that one rat. I'm in the wrong business. No, they well, it's a it's a big complicated deal what they do, but they make it's a good business. And and what happens is the scientist puts writes up a grant, makes a proposal, and he either gets the money to buy the rats knowing they cost that much, or his grant proposal is refused. And so at the end of the year, Harlan Spray Dolly has a bunch of three-year-old rats with breast cancer that aren't going to live very long. Well, they sell them for like a quarter apiece. You know, and they, they, they sell them to a guy in Madison who buys them, kills them, freezes them. And it's not just they just rats in general. He buys all these rats for a, like a quarter apiece. And he goes over, picks them up, takes them home, kills them, frees them, and then vacuum packs them. And they're delivered by FedEx to your door and uh, uh, in any quantities that you want. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry. It's a, they are, snakes are here to stay in American um, homes. And they, uh, uh, so you could, so it's like I say, you just put, you take out this pack and pack, put it in your freezer and then thaw, you know, thaw it out for four or five hours. And when it's room temperature, put it in the snake cage and it'll eat it. How much does that rat cost you? Um, it, uh, about a dollar and a quarter. Wagyu rat. 
Yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's, and, and yeah, no, we, and, and we could raise rats, and we haven't, my wife and I both have them years ago, but you, they're a lot more work than the snakes. <laughs> it's just like, buy them dinner, and you know, just, uh, so anyway, this is, this is the, this is a, a beautiful snake, and, uh, and a, and a hill country snake, and then I've got this one other spectacular snake. What is the tongue? You, you talked about the come, on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm always, I'm shocked at how nice Barrett's rat snakes are. The, um, okay, a snake's tongue, okay, when we humans smell something, we have a space in our skull called the olfactory sac, and we have the air passages, they're called the internal nares, go from our nose through the olfactory sac and then pat down past the soft tongue, top, uh, top glottis, and, and down the trachea. Um, and, and in the olfactory sac, there's the, the olfactory nerve comes directly from the brain, it's a really short uh, cranial nerve, and it's got all these nerve endings in the olfactory sac, and so any particles of scent that are floating in the air are filtered out and the scent is analyzed. Same thing, snakes do exactly the same thing. Plus, their olfactory sac also opens into the roof of their mouth. So, when a snake flicks his tongue out, he flicks his tongue out, and part, it's just a wet tongue. It, it just, it's muscular, there's no taste buds on it, there's no sensory ability to it at all. It detects heat. I mean, if it flips it out, touches a hot, hot rock or whatever, you go snake. Ah! But it did a, um, so they flick this little wet tongue out and then they pull it back in and as they pull it back in their mouth, uh, okay, and then they also touch it to the ground, right? So you've got particles from the ground here and particles from the air here. So as the snake, every time the snake flicks out his tongue, as he pulls his tongue in, he's got two muscular bumps in the floor of his mouth that uh, raise up and they push the tongue up against that opening to the olfactory sac and there's a bunch of little tiny cilia there that clean off the, the, the particles of scent and then and on the bottom these two bumps are collecting what's on the bottom of the tongue so then the tongue goes all the way back into what's called the tongue sheath it's kind of on the throat of the snake and these two bumps go up and touch the olfactory sac so so the particles of scent for the, that the snake is, so what that lets a snake do is that like bloodhounds have an incredible sense of smell, but they can only smell suspended particles of scent. So after a rain or after a couple of days, the particles of scent have dissipated and a bloodhound can't follow the trail. A snake can actually pick up the, the molecules from the mouse's feet and a, a snake can follow a mouse trail that's three weeks old and a, blood, a bloodhound can't do it. And their abilities to detect, is well, that's one of their best senses, is their sense of smell. But they, and they have a sense of smell just by breathing with their nose, like we do, but they have an incredible sense of smell, very directional, and hey, so why the fork? Because it adds, it gives you a directional sense of smell. There have been all sorts of studies where they put a trail down and the trail goes one way, and the snake come, you know, comes out, flicks his tongue, and goes, let's go in that way. You know, if they want it, or if they want to avoid it, they may go that way, but they the, the, they have directional sense of smell because it's more stronger on this time than it is on this time, that smell. And they they totally analyze it and they're totally able to do it. It's, and it's an amazing thing that snakes do. And it's, but, uh, okay, this is uh, uh, the biggest snake in Texas. And in fact, as is appropriate, this one isn't the species. This species is the biggest snake in Texas. This is the bull snake. And this is the snake that I, that I found as a tiny baby crossing the road. And my, my bull snake that I'd had for 20 years had, and I used for talks like this had just died. So I kept this snake. She's now four. And, uh, and you know, this is like, like the American python. <laughs> there, this is a big snake. The biggest snake ever found in the United States was a bull snake 
caught eight miles from where she's from in Loma Alta, Texas, and it was nine feet three inches long. How long is she? Uh, she's a little over six feet, I think. Now, is bull a family of snakes, or is it is a bull snake, not a more name to it? It's this is a this is a um, a snake called a bull snake, and the bull snake genus includes pine snakes and gopher snakes. Gopher snakes are found in West Texas. Bull snakes are found in Central Texas and East Texas, and all the way up into Kansas and, and uh, Northern Illinois yeah. and whatever. And they're big snakes. This is the one of the snakes that was in the old days was a big prairie dog predator because they went right down the hole where the prairie dogs were and they ate them. Um, now there's very few prairie dogs left in the world, but they they've gone on. They get big enough to eat rabbits. They get big enough to eat you know all small young turkeys. They get big enough to to eat a variety of things. And you can see she, her little tongue is just moving away. But every time she flicks it out, as two little bumps. She's tip, she's pulling up. How much does she weigh? Probably three pounds. Stand up. Yes. I mean, she's substantial, but she's not heavy. It's not like she's like, people are like, aren't you worried about that constricting you to death? I'm like, there's no snake, there's no animal in the world that weighs three pounds that can kick my butt. You <laughs> 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 have a lot of snakes. You're not referencing, of course, the ones that have escaped, like in Florida, where they have the huge snakes that are not really native, right? Uh, yeah, I know. I talked to Congress about that. Actually, in 2010, I, I testified in front of a committee about Burmese pythons. And the thing is, they don't belong there. And if I could snap my fingers and make them go away, I'd do that. But in 6,000 years of written history in Southeast Asia, there are no records of an attack by that snake on a human being. But they're killing off the wildlife. No, they're not. The thing is, well, they're not really. And and and, uh, and I say that because, okay, they said, oh, they, ate, they killed all the raccoons. We've lost all the raccoons in South Florida. Well, U.S. Fish and Wildlife that runs Everglades National Park for 30 years has been exterminating raccoons. <laughs> and they finally, they were like, where did all the raccoons go? Well, you've been killing them for 30 years. And they're like, oh, well, they, they might eat a Florida panther, a highly endangered animal. They got down to 16 Florida panthers about 20 years ago, and someone in their brilliance, they came to te West Texas, caught 30 adult mountain lions, took them to Florida, and let them go to breed with the Florida panthers. There are no pure Florida panthers left in Florida. The state of Florida has, has released there are 7,600 species of plants and animals that are known to exist in the Everglades, and over 3,000 of them are in, in introduced invasive species. Mm -hmm. There's two colonies, large colonies of monkeys. There's 40 species of parrots that are known to be established there and breeding. There's only one or two, uh, maybe three or four species of lizards that are native to South Florida, because South Florida was underwater 11,000 years ago. But there's now 60 species of lizards in Florida, and they're all released from the, you know, the exotic pet animal of every kind and the exotic plant industry are centered in Miami because it's the most tropical place where we've got. And so things got loose. Well, yeah, okay, they did. The, the, the python, the, the thing about the python deals, you have, um, okay, the Guam tree snake. Right, got loose on Guam, right. and it killed. The, and Guam has no predators, and so there are like 25 species of birds. 16 of them are flightless, and all the flightless ones have been killed yeah. by the Guam tree snake. And there are six species of lizards on Guam. They've, I think, all but one have been killed. <clears throat> two species of bat, three species of bats native only to Guam. Two of them have been killed by the Guam tree snake. All right, U.S. government took over that project in 1980 to, to eradicate, in Guam, the western facing radar, um, the only way we know that the Soviets in, at the time it shot missiles at us that we would know they were coming over the Pacific was the Guam radar array. Well, the snakes started 
the Guam tree snakes started crawling into the trance as it got more and more common. They didn't have anything that was snake proof and it was crawling into buildings, crawling into control boards, crawling into power transformers and it shorted them out so where they were, they were out for days and days and days and they get back up and running again and then the snake would short it out again. So the United States has invested somewhere, since 1980, the United States has invested somewhere, we can't tell because there's separate fund lines of funding from the military and from the government, but somewhere between 400 million and, uh, and 800 million dollars to control the Guam tree snakes. There's more Guam tree snakes in Guam today than there was in 1980 when they started the program. And all that money, that massive amount of money Nobody bought that I know of, bought a Cadillac or, 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 or I mean, an expensive car, or built an expensive house, or you know, pocketed the money. They took that money and they paid graduate students to come, you know, postdocs and graduate students to study invasive snake biology. And so they trained hundreds of, youth, of, of American kids to be invasive snake biologists. The problem is the Guam tree snake was the only invasive snake. There's only one project that once they finish their degree, they, they got all the smarts, they got all the training, they got the experience. There's no jobs, there's no work for an invasive snake biologist. And so the Burmese pythons in Florida were like a gift from God because they didn't want to go to Guam anyway. It's hot and sweaty and there's nothing to do. And in Florida, it's, it's like, you know, it's the greatest thing in the world that they made it into Florida. Okay, well, the first thing you have to do if you've got... These government biologists, they, they get half, their pet, they're, they're in the invasive species programs and they work for USGS. And they get paid half a salary. And the rest of their salary is from the, the uh, proposals that they make to private people and to, and to the government. Okay, so you're not gonna make any money, you're not gonna get any proposals unless, first you've gotta prove that there's a terrible problem Right? And, there, and at first they did this climate, ridiculous climate studies that said that they were going to, in 20 years, have spread all the way to San Francisco from the Everglades. And then along the way they were going to eat grandmothers and pets. And, <laughs> and uh, they actually said that. And uh, they were actually telling, you know, well they may attack elderly people. It was like, and... They, they made it a huge problem, and the media just ate it up. Alien pythons invade southern United States. Well, it sounded like flying saucers dropped them off. They were the most common pet for teenage herpers. You know, and I, I really wanted to, like at a Senate hearing, get like a class of 30 ballerinas and little pink tutus and get like about a 20 foot Burmese python and they could all hold it. 30 of them in a row and run through the uh, audience holding this big python over their head. I thought it would be great TV. But it, uh, we never did it. They, they, uh, and it's kind of died down, but they're still, you know, they wrote an article about Burmese python attacks on humans in the Everglades. But if you read the article, it's a scientist's paper, it was published in a, in a journal called Invasive Biology. No, yeah, totally. And then, they, and then this is a snake that the pattern changes on the tail. Mm -hmm. The pattern what? The pattern they change, changes. They, they, they get a, the, the, the blotches get a little bolder and smaller and closer yeah, together. Right there. But it's like there's like a glitch in the. Yeah, no, no, that, no, that's just they, everyone's unique. Everyone's unique. All right, I, was, I, I didn't even cover anything about venomous snakes, and the time is running out. So let me briefly talk about venomous snakes because they're the elephant in the room. Oh, the other thing I didn't say was that. To, to jog your memories about snakes when, people, when you're guiding groups of people around or whatever. Snakes are short, slow, and silent. The acronym is SSS. Psst. Right? <laughs> it's the noise a snake makes. Um, the, um, I, this has happened to me twice. It's happened to me twice. I've been standing in line in the checkout line at the HEB and had a young adult walk up to me. I'm, uh, in both cases, it were young men in their early 20s and they, and they came they came up to me and said, excuse me, are you the snake guy? Well, I'm in Bernie, I look fairly distinctive. And I said, yeah, I'm the, I'm the snake guy. And they go, you don't know me, but you came to my fourth grade class. 
And I have never forgotten the snakes are short, slow, and silent. And I have never let anyone hurt a snake in my presence. And that, it works. It, it works. And uh, um, so it's a, it's a really good thing. But the, the elephant in the room is that there are some snakes that are venomous. They don't behave in, they don't really know they're venomous. I mean, they don't act, they don't swagger, they don't like, come on, bring it on. It's like, they're just snakes as far as they're concerned. And they often bite people and don't even fang them or don't even inject venom in them. They, don't, they bite them just in a defensive bite, leave me alone, whatever, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here. It's usually what they're saying is like, don't step on me, I'm here. Um, Every year in the United States, somewhere between zero and ten people die of a venomous snake bite. Some years nobody dies. Some years ten people die. Half of the people that die from venomous snake bites in the United States were keeping the snake in their home, in a cage. And it bit them in a do when they did something stupid. Um, the, uh, um, they, they made a mistake and they paid a price. A venomous snake bite is a terrible, terrible thing. And it's scary because it might kill you, but it might, it probably won't. You know, every year in the United States, about 6,000 people a year are bitten by venomous snakes and seek professional, that's an estimate. Every year, about 1,000 people actually seek professional medical uh, uh, treatment for, for venomous snakes. And that number really hasn't changed over, um, at least the last 30 years. Uh, it's about a thousand people get bit. Do you have them the snakes that you keep? No, no, no I did. I used to keep rattlesnakes, but I haven't had a venomous snake in 40 years because with age comes some wisdom. And, <laughs> and your reflexes get slower and all sorts of things happen and you just have to accept it. No, I, so venomous snake bite should be um, treated seriously uh, if, you, if you are bitten by a venomous snake. And if you're not certain whether or not you're bit, bitten by a venomous snake, you still better be safe than sorry. Now here's the thing. We have two general kinds of venomous snakes in the United States. We have pit vipers, which are rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths. And we have uh, elapids, which are coral snakes. And okay, in, in hill country, the common venomous snake is the coral snake. They're everywhere. They live underground and they eat other snakes. They're uh, they eat the little, there's a group of little snakes called flower bed snakes, and that are the rough earth snake, the, the uh, ground snake, the striped, the, the line snake, the uh, decays, uh, the brown, uh, did I say brown snake? The, uh, but there's, there's snakes that you find under flagstones around your garden, they eat earthworms or whatever. That's what coral snakes eat. Um, they, coral snakes are rarely above ground. I've rescued coral snakes out of yards that were one block off of Main Street. They're, they're, there's probably no place where they're, I mean, they're, they're here, but they're underground and you don't see them unless they get flooded out of their burrows. Coral snake bait, they live in burrow systems, we think. We don't really know much about what snakes are doing underground, but we think they live in burrow systems. And the females lay their eggs in the burrow system, and when the babies hatch out, they live in the mother's burrow system until they approach sexual maturity, then she runs them out. And so most of the coral snakes we see, we see in October. They're a year and a half old and they're about that long. A big breeding coral snake can be three and a half feet long. And it's a pretty big snake, but you almost never, ever see them. You see the babies that are, they're like, all right, Junior, out of here. And then that baby's like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Because they don't dig burrows. They use somebody else's burrows. And they're like, so they're crawling around and they're lost and they're hole they go down. There's either another coral snake down there or, something else and they're just trying to find a place to fit into the world. Coral snakes, the coral snake bite is especially, it's incredibly rare. Coral snakes have really, really dangerous venom, but they have really short fangs and they, they uh, so a coral snake can't bite to your socks. They certainly can't bite to your tennis shoe or your pants. They can't bite to your socks. They, uh, um, and coral snakes are funny because coral snakes, a coral snake is a snake. And when they catch their prey, they strike and catch their prey. But coral snakes don't strike in defense. 
So if you see a coral snake walk crawling along, I don't really recommend you do this, but you could wave your finger right in front of his nose like little, 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 and they won't bite you. But if you touch a coral snake, they, they snap back and bite. If you touch a coral snake, you can't get your finger out of there fast enough, that sucker's gonna bite you. And so, but they won't bite you if you're like, oh, little, 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 little. They, I mean, they could. So I'm not saying don't do it, because that's how they catch their prey. They're perfectly capable of doing it. But that's not part of their defensive suite of behaviors. They don't strike out and, and you know, as you walk by them, they don't strike out and bite you on the sock. If you step on them, they'll curl up and thrash around and grab onto whatever they can grab on. And if you've got shoes and socks on, they're not going to hurt you. The problem with coral snake bites, it's very, very serious venom. There's only two or three envenomations every five years. It's so rare, and it's always somebody who was holding it or trying to pick it up or trying to catch it. Um, the person picked the fight. The coral snake just bit him. The, the problem with the coral snake bite, though, is it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt at all. It's like you're like, wow, he bit me. Oh, that must have been one of those king snakes that looks like a coral snake, but it's not a coral snake, and it you know, didn't hurt. And then 30 minutes later, you realize you can't open your eyes, or you can't close your mouth, or you're bitten on this finger and this arm and hand go completely paralyzed, or you start having trouble breathing, and they kill you by paralyzing your, your ability to breathe. And, and uh, the treatment for a coral snake bite is put you in an iron lung and you're fine. It just breathe, let the machine breathe for you, or a ventilator. Good luck finding a ventilator these days, but it's like, <laughs> Uh, put and and uh, they can you, the, the venom will work its way out of his body without doing any tissue damage. And the, the recommended first aid for a coral snake bite is go to a doctor as fast as you can. It's, nothing's going to happen to you that's immediate. You know, it's only in cowboy westerns where somebody gets bit by a venomous snake, a rattlesnake, or whatever. They go, oh, tell mom I love her and fall down dead. If you're going to die, it's usually one or two or three days later. You know. The other group of venomous snakes we have, the pit vipers. None of the pit vipers are very common in Kendall County and, and, and in hill country in general. There's, I'm not aware of any place where there's a, a surplus of venomous pit vipers. There's, we have rock rattlesnakes, blacktail rattlesnakes, diamondback rattlesnakes um, in hill country. And we have cop, one broadbanded copperheads. There's no known fatalities from a bite from a broad-banded copperhead. And we have caught mouse in a, in a few places in Hill Country. But there's no, there, my sons and I have been working at Sybil and Nature Center. And we've been going around, and as far as I, there are, and I've researched this, there are no records of cot, cotton mouse, the, the aquatic venomous snake. Everybody who grew up in Bernie will tell you there's cottonmouths here because we have a common harmless water snake called the diamondback water snake that looks like a cottonmouth and acts, doesn't act friendly, doesn't whatever, and it's just a big, you know, heavily keeled, scaled snake like that bull snake. Um, they, they, uh, uh, and if you, you know, you try to catch them and they, if you kill one and you open his mouth, I mean, I, work, I used to work at the zoo, and one of the things that zoos do, I worked at a couple of zoos, is they identify the snakes that people kill. They bring them to the zoo, and they go, see, he's got a white mouth, it's a cotton mouth. Well, every snake in the United States has a white mouth. You know, cotton mouths, the name comes from something that they do that no other snake does. Cotton mouths, no other snake in the United States does. There are other places where this is a common behavior, but it's not in the United States. It's called an open mouth threat response. And cottonmouths are usually coiled with their head in the center of the coil, out in the grass, somewhere 10 feet from the water. And if you walk up on them, they don't want you to step on them. In order to keep from being stepped on, snakes do this little behavior, thrashing, moving, stinking, striking. And rattlesnakes rattle for that. That's when rattlesnakes rattle. And that's when cottonmouths do an open mouth threat response. And all that is is they raise their head up, open their mouth wide, and wave it at you like a white flag. Just about like that. And you're like, no other snake does that. If you're looking at a snake and he's waving his white mouth at you, that's a cottonmouth. But 
And then the other thing, you can kind of identify cottonmouths at a distance if they're swimming because cottonmouths can usually, all 90, more than 90% of the time, they look like they're made out of balsa wood. They sit on the top of the water and they're completely all the way out to their tail. Their whole snake is floating on top of the water. You see them going across the lake or the river or whatever. Water snakes have their head at the top of the water, but their body is down at a 30 degree angle and they make a V from their head, but you can't see any of the snake. The snake's underwater. Well, we've got two kinds of harmless water snakes in Kendall County, and there's another kind that's up, if you go up toward Austin, there's another harmless water snake. Um, they're very common. They're in every body of water, with a stock tank or a water. It, 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 they're, they're there. Cottonmouths are not that way. But there are just a few reports of cottonmouths, in, the, in museums anyway, from Comal County, there's a few from Southern Bear County. Uh, they're not known to exist in, in uh, Bandera County, um, Kerr County, um, Fredericksburg, Fre uh, no, what's Fredericksburg? Gillespie. Gillespie County. They're not known to exist in, now I'm not, I, when I was younger I would say there are no cottonmouths in Kendall County, but somebody could have just taken their cottonmouth down there and let them go. So, I mean, so as, what I can say with certainty is there are no museum records, there's no published records, there's no, and we've been looking at cottonmouths out of Sidlow Nature Center, and my sons and I have gone around to other water places in Kendall County. We can't find any evidence that anywhere is there uh, was a cottonmouth ever in Kendall County. But that doesn't mean that there's not some of the people. There's the, right there where Guadalupe State Park Natural Park is, they might be there, um, right upstream from that park for a little bit. But they're not along the Guadalupe up here. But they're in the Guadalupe on the other stuff by Ingram. Mm -hmm. There's there's cottonmouths up there, but there's a stretch right here where we don't seem to have Kegels, map turtles, or cottonmouths, and nobody knows why. Um, the uh, um, so okay, so those are the questions. I'll answer any questions you've got. I've got snakes you can hold, and I wanted to say that. And this is an important thing probably for you to say to the people who in the future will be asking you questions. I didn't come here hoping to make you like snakes. Um, I, I, every person that you talk to, and you guys yourselves, but I'm not worried about your actions in the future, but, but every person you talk to, the, my point is like what I, the result I want is that Every one of those people at some point in the future will be with a group of people on a picnic or fishing, fishing or hunting or camping or whatever. And somebody in the group will go, hey, there's a snake over here. And if you, if you say, you know, the, somebody will say, let's kill it. Go get a shovel, go get the car, go get the ATV or whatever. If you say, no, look, we're out in nature. They've got to live somewhere. Let, leave that snake alone. Let's just walk away from it. And uh, it's not going to chase us. It's not going. I don't care if it's a rattlesnake. It's not going to do any damage. Uh, this is where they live. We have to have places for them to live. And so, if you can stop somebody from killing a snake, you've done a really, really good thing. And then I've done a good thing. That's why I do the talks. And at this point, let me put some snakes out that you can hold, and some snakes out you can look at. And if any of you got questions. I'd be happy to, so we're on video, so the one thing is you, please don't ask me a question that I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, how do they move? I'm sorry, what? How do they move? I mean, I understand they're slithering, but I was reading, that uh, they were talking about sometimes they use scales or something to grip the ground. And they, they can, and uh, an interesting thing, I don't know, if, about six a month ago, more or less, um, there was an article, a little short article, a little blurb in uh, the the uh, Wall Street, or the uh, New York Times that said a, a researcher was researching how sidewinders are able to move on loose sand. Come on now, puppy! And they could go 15 miles an hour, and they were the fastest snake in the world. I've caught sidewinders. Sidewinders can't go more than two miles an hour. I can't, if that. 
And I don't know where that came, I, I found a reference to it, the quote was taken from a National Geographic online article about this woman's research. But I'm sure she, I never saw any retraction to it, but she had to have been mortified because rattlesnakes don't go, no rattlesnake goes. Like I say, the fastest rattlesnake ever measured so far as I, okay, who would like to hold a snake? I will. What, what, is, what, is, what is it? Huh? What is it? This is a pastel albino. It's a, it's a color move. It's a ball python. It's a hard oh, snake. that's what I used to handle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Except okay. it was smaller ball. than this one. I used to do it for the Baton Rouge Sioux. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. These are, these are, these are, these are fairly big adults. You fat? Yeah. Oh, actually, this is the pastel albino. That's the super Mojave. Oh. Yeah. Have a nice. Aren't you pretty? Anyone? Good eyes. Any takers? One thing that you have to watch, you know, if you're showing snakes to, to uh, you, you know, a, a group of people, you're showing snakes, they go, will it bite? I need another snake. Here we go. They say, will, will it bite? And, they, and you say, no, it won't. And then, you know, can I touch it? And, they'll say, and you say, yes. And so they pat it on top of the head. Which is like walking up to a stranger and going, hi, how are you? And it's like snakes don't like to be patted on top of their little delicate heads. Yeah. Who is this? This is a pie ball. Okay. Pie ball. Pie ball. Ball python. Yes. It's a These are three ball pythons. Okay. These are what why people like the the pets because you can breed them and look any which way. Yeah. There's no scientific data that anyone would like. Plus, who would volunteer for that anyway? It's not <laughs> So, uh, we are able to hold it. You want to hold it? It's not like it. Yeah, that's not like it. They're just, you, you, I've gone out from, you know, they, somebody let that go in my yard. It's like, it's not an angel hiding here. Yeah. And there's, that snake's been here for, you know, that's how she eats that way for a hundred years before. They've always been here. You just never saw one before. It's like, Definitely, that's some of that. That's pretty upset about that. Well, they ball pop-ups. That was that copper one. How are you? my favorite. She was a little active, but you can hold her if you want. Aren't you a beauty? She's just gorgeous. Yes, she are. Do you like my camera? Do you like the camera? Is that what you like? You like the camera? Do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you're a pretty one. I'm moving them to try to keep her Yes, you are. You, you know, yeah. as she kind of gets away from you. Yeah, when yeah, we did this kind of thing, I thought it really helped me. Like, I think I like the red snake. The bear red snake? Yeah, but the color hey, was babe. so dark. Oh, no. I, I had a hard time with Smile, this. Smile, you're on candy camera. Yeah, <laughs> that, you made it bigger? Um, there we go. Sure. Mm -hmm. This one moves around. I said, just keep Look at that. It was pretty it's young. It's a bear dress. It is a bear dress. Well, see, when bear dress, oh, it's a ball and this was fun. Only yeah. like to be in a ball. Eight, maybe yeah. it's so about six feet tall. It's, no. it's got it. It's getting in its stripes. Much. See, okay. she's striped and doesn't She's peeking, though. She's peeking at me. Hey, she just has these two stripes. Yeah. Right. What did you ask? I'm sorry. What was I saying? The temperatures. Are they cooling off in this air? They'll cool off in this. This is a little. This is his hand. Because she just assumes 